Well, we've been through the Christmas season, we've been through New Year's, and guess where we're going back to today? John. John. <laughs> That's right, we're going back to John. I'm not sure how we're going to complete John with, with, with Easter being relatively close to us right now, but uh, we'll see how that goes. But today, I, I want to remind you that Jesus is still in the upper room as we look at uh, chapter 17 of John. John chapter 17. Uh, he's still in the upper room. He's getting ready to leave, but it's been quite a night um, of teaching, and not only with, with words, but by example, uh, washing the disciples' feet, um, and uh, then all of the teaching that he has uh, given to them. But he ends the evening with this, this prayer, and I'm going to read uh, down through verse, um, uh, well, actually the whole chapter. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you, you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified." My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Well, to say the least, uh, 2020 was quite the year. A year of uh, seeing a lot of things that we never dreamed we would see. It's a time where a lot of changes have taken place. And for many, it's been a year where fear was the emotion of the day. Whether it's the pandemic, the economy, politics, whether it's good versus evil, we live in a time where emotions are on edge and the future feels 
uncertain to most people. How should the church respond to our world today? What should the church be doing? What should be our priorities as followers of Jesus Christ? How should we seek to have a positive impact on the society and culture around us? Let's be truthful. I think we can do that here. The church doesn't have the influence it used to have. Would you agree? I've shared some of my views with you in, my, in the short period I've been your pastor of, of why I think church has lost its influence. But here are, here's the cliff note. I believe that we have turned church into a business and church has become a self-promoting organization. That's it. I believe that the circumstances of our time, God is, is uh, that in the circumstances of our time, God is calling us to return to him, being head of the church. He's calling us to get rid of the worldly values that we as church, both as organization and as individuals, have adopted in our lives. And also the procedures of the world that the church has adopted. We are not a business, and we don't run by the business. The bottom line is not the bottom line for the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and I truly believe if we will allow him, he is using this time in America and throughout the world to give the church a chance for him to truly be head, not only of the church as an organization, but of each one of us as individuals. So having said all that, now we go to John 17. This is the last thing Jesus says in the upper room, and that upper room he said a lot. This is the last thing he said. Normally the last thing you say is the thing you want people to remember, right? It's not the last thing he said to the disciples. He's got another month or so before he'll... Uh, be through speaking to them here on earth. But it is the last thing that he said that night, the night that he was betrayed. And I think that it's important. I believe it shows us, this prayer shows us the heart and the desire of Jesus for his disciples and for his church ongoing. It also, I believe, reveals the priorities that he believes, which if he believes them, then they are the priorities that are essential for his church to go forward and make an impact on the world. We know that we have the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, right? I think this prayer right here could, could very easily be named the Lord's Prayer. This is truly the Lord's Prayer. He begins... This is the time, the hour has come. It's time for the Son to be glorified, and by virtue of the, the intimacy of relationship that the Father and the Son have with each other, it is also time for the Father to be glorified. Jesus, glorified by the Father, happens because he is completing his mission here on the earth. His mission was to accomplish all that was necessary for people to have eternal life. It's the work of Jesus. It is his work that gives him the authority to give life, eternal life, to others. And this mention of authority, whenever I say authority and Jesus, I automatically go to the Great Commission. Jesus begins that Great Commission of telling us to go make disciples by telling us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. All authority. Jesus has all authority. Therefore, we can do what he tells us to do knowing that he's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. This time or this hour for Jesus, it wasn't just simply his death he's referring to. He has in mind, I believe, everything that is about to transpire over the next 40 days or so. 
his arrest, his beatings, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and yes, his ascension to his father. This is the hour his life has been leading to since his birth. This is the hour that his, his life has been leading to since before creation even happened. It is the culmination of God's redemptive work for mankind. Jesus spoke as if everything had already happened. He said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. His work wasn't complete yet, was it? He hadn't died yet. He didn't rise yet. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. There's no doubt in Jesus' mind. There's no doubt about what he's going to do. I believe it's in uh, James that says that if we, we ask with wavering, if we ask with doubt, we're like a waving of the sea. Jesus had no doubts. He was committed to doing God's will no matter what that will was. Most of us pray for God to let us know his will, and then we'll figure out whether or not we're going to do it. You will never know God's will with that kind of stance before God. God requires that we not be like one who is like wave tossed back and forth by the waves of the sea. He commands that we be obedient to him no matter what, so that when we ask him for his will, we're not asking just to know. We're asking so that we can do. Jesus Christ had lived his life that way as he walked the face of the earth, and he knew. He knew what was coming before him, and he knew he would complete his task. He said in the course of this statement, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Has that comment ever bugged you? This is eternal life, that they may know you? I've heard some quote this verse and say that uh, we're misguided to think that we're going to live forever. Eternal life doesn't mean living forever. Eternal life means knowing God. A correct understanding, though, would see both the nature and the length of life here. Knowing the Father and His Son is what gives us eternal life. If you know the Father and the Son, you have eternal life. And in having eternal life, you know the Father and the Son. Does that make sense? If we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we don't know the Father and the Son, we do not have eternal life. Eternal life, yes, it's going to be knowing God as we've never known him before, in intimacy we've never experienced with him before. It's going to be life as it was meant to be, pure fellowship with God and with each other, and no sin. It's going to be a wonderful life. Jesus says that he gave the disciples everything the Father wanted him to give. He taught them. He revealed himself to him, and he revealed his Father to them. He revealed God to the world. He was the light of the world. And he says the, ex the disciples accepted what Jesus gave them. Yeah, it took them a while. They were pretty hard-headed. But yeah, they did accept what Jesus said. He said, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They know with certainty that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. Even still, though, that, I mean, that word certainty. Boy, I look at the disciples even on this night, and I still see a lot of sleepiness we'll see later on. But Jesus says with certainty they have believed. Because of this, because they've believed... The disciples of Jesus now have a mission to complete. It is the mission of continuing to reveal Jesus to the world, to testify about Jesus. So knowing their mission, knowing what lies ahead of them, Jesus continues. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. 
Here's, here's my paraphrase of what Jesus is about to say. Father, I've done my part. I will no longer be here to reveal myself and you to the world, but the disciples you gave me will still be here and will continue this work. Father, they need our help. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is about ready to go to his father, and he's asking his father to protect his disciples. The source of his protection is his father's name. That simply is a reference to the majesty and the power, the might of Almighty God, that his name will protect them. It's a common statement in the Old Testament. Jesus is calling upon his Father to protect us as we remain in the world and to continue his mission. He's, he's asking his Father to protect us as we go about his mission in this world. I think we're protected. What do you think? He asks the same thing in verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. The church went through this time. You may have been alive in that time. I was alive. So you probably were too then. That meant where, the, where the church was saying, come out! Come out of the world! And Christians left the world. And guess what? The world went to hell. Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you to keep them in the world and protect them there. And that protection is twofold. It's within and it's without. The disciples and those who follow, which means us, when we take up the mission of Christ, we need God's protection from this world, from this, this world organization, this, the way the world sees things, the, the, the life without God type thing. And we need protection from the prince of this world and everything he stands for. For. If the church is really on mission for Jesus Christ, the world will never agree with the mission. The world will never agree with the mission of Jesus. And Satan will always try to disrupt our attempts of testifying for Jesus. As we, as a church, commit to go forward with the mission of God, you can be fairly certain there will be objection from the world. We also need protection from within. The NIV translates it as evil one, protect them from the evil one, but it can very simply just be evil, just like in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, keep us from the evil one or evil. It doesn't have to be the evil one. I, I think it reminds us of the Lord's Prayer when he says, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Jesus prays that the Father will give us protection from sin itself. You ever felt the need for that? <laughs> He's praying that we'll be committed to the obedience that comes by faith. And then Jesus says, For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus was holy, absolutely sinless. It was possible for him to sin. Don't let anyone ever tell you that the deity of Christ overrode his humanity. He had and was able to sin, but he didn't. But holiness doesn't just mean without sin. It means set aside or consecrated. Jesus lived his life completely set aside to obedience to his Father, like none of us have ever even thought about doing. And he did that for our sake. And now he asks that we do the same, that we set aside our life, consecrate our life for and to him. 
and that we do so striving to be holy without sin. Impossible, right? It's impossible for us to be without sin this side of God's kingdom. Nevertheless, that should never give us the excuse to sin. We should strive toward holiness. We are not just called to be sinless. We're not just called to to be good. God has a purpose for us to be here, and that purpose is to complete the mission of Jesus Christ. We are to be sold out for Jesus' mission. If there's one thing I would want this church to be committed to as we begin this new year, it is that we will be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That we will share him. There are people dying. I had a friend die this uh, Christmas season. Lived out at Dallin Park. A friend. Let's say an acquaintance. I had conversations with him. I don't believe he knew the Lord. And I never asked him. I don't want that to ever happen again in my life. There are people dying that do not know Jesus Christ. Are we willing to speak for Jesus? That they might have life realizing that he protects us? And that he has all authority? And there ain't nothing Satan can do to keep Jesus from doing what he wants to do in anyone's life. All we have to do is be obedient. And he'll use us. Nothing should pollute our desire to be faithful to the mission we have in Jesus. This protection from within also um, refers to unity. Unity. Jesus said, so that they may be one as we are one. And then later on he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. Hmm. And have loved them even as you have loved me. We can't read those verses without realizing that the unity of the body of Christ and the effectiveness of the body of Christ with the mission of Christ are tied together. We will not be effective as long as the body of Christ is divided. And that's one of the big reasons why the the Church of Jesus Christ in America is failing right now. The church in, in America isn't one. I'll talk to that in just a second, but let me just say that because you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have the Son living in you, the Father living in you. You have God living in you. I do too. That makes us one in Christ. We're one. That is the reality. But but Jesus is praying that as we go about our daily living and as the church of Jesus Christ operates on this mission for Jesus, that the world will see our oneness, observe our oneness, that the way we relate to each other and that the way we work together on mission will show the world that we are one. And it is in being one that Jesus says, the world will know that God sent him. That's pretty important. If our lack of oneness, if oneness shows that God sent him, what does our lack of oneness show? That would be my question. Now, some take these verses to mean that uh, we should do away with all denominations. I, I don't think that's true. I think we should get rid of some denominations for sure. Some of them have gone the way of the devil. But Jesus isn't talking about structure here. He's talking about our mission. We have denominations as part of our structure, but our structure should never interfere with our mission of together, together testifying of Jesus Christ to a lost world. 
all God's people, all God's churches should be working in unity to complete the mission of Jesus. What a tragedy in our world that churches of different denominations, and even of the same denomination, seldom work together to do anything for the kingdom of God. Nothing! I tell you what, pastors are some of the most egotistical, narcissistic people I know. I'm serious. I read a book, When Narcissism Comes to the Church. This guy said 90% of pastors today in America are narcissistic. We're prideful. We're jealous. We're fearful that somebody might like you better than they like me. And that has kept the church of Jesus Christ separated. We can get together for political agendas. We can get together to fight this or to fight this. How often do we see local churches getting together to do anything for the cause of Christ? And I mean more than just having a fish fry. I mean, how do we get together and strategize and say, this is how we're going to reach Live Oak for Jesus Christ this year. Can you imagine if the church in, in, in Live Oak did that? Baptists, whatever, everybody. Can you imagine if we had a strategic, all churches in, this is what we're going to do. We're going to flood Live Oak with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It'll never happen. It'll never happen until the church bows its knee to the true head of the church. I pray for that day to happen. Jesus looks forward. Uh, let me go back. Unit, unity uh, isn't just outside the church with other churches. It's here too. There, there is nothing that destroys a church more than lack of unity. We must all be on mission. There is nothing more important than being on mission. Everything we do in our individual lives too should be somehow in the mission of Christ. But as a church, nothing should take precedence over the mission of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus had been on this earth for 30-something years. For three years, he'd been in missions, his ministry. And here toward the end, I get the impression he's really longing to be with his father again. He says, Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you love me from the creation of the world. And then he goes on to say, I want to know, I want to know again the presence that I had with you before the creation of the world. I've talked about a lot of application here already, but I just want you to let me regurgitate some things as we begin this new year. Jesus was concerned for his disciples because he was physically leaving them. He had invested his life in them. He'd given them his purpose. He had given to them saving knowledge of himself. And he wants them to continue to testify. This is Jesus' heart for his church. We need to grasp that. Receive that. Do it. This message, this mission, it's now ours. And there is nothing more important for us as Westside Baptist Church than to be a part of that mission and to do our best to engage other churches to be involved in that mission with us. And if you find another pastor that you like better than me, I, I mean, I know that's virtually impossible, but if you do find <laughs> another pastor that you like more than me, go ahead, I don't care. I'm seriously over that these days. God is God, and I know that if you want to go somewhere else, you probably ought to. And we'll probably be better off if you do. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying that God knows, and God works, and God, God is in control. Amen. 
we shouldn't hide, we shouldn't withdraw from the world. We need to be present in the world every day. I've been asking God to, to bring Marta back to Walmart. I'm gonna tell you something I've learned. Don't just give your phone number, get their phone number. I wish I could call Marta and talk to her. I haven't seen her again. When we go to Walmart, when we go to Publix, you're on mission, folks. God wants to use you there if you open your eyes and let him use you. He's got opportunities everywhere we go to share Jesus Christ. And can I just tell you that the non-Christian is not our enemy? The person on the political side of the aisle different from you is not your enemy. Everybody who doesn't know Jesus, I would, I would like for us to start calling them not yet Christian rather than non-Christians because God sent his son to die for them. And let's be united in our mission. And as a church, let's don't be split up. You know, there are some people that think worship is the most important thing that we can do. There are other people think that the that the singing is the most important thing we can do or that the preaching is the most important thing we can do or that the, the carpet is the most important thing. I'm looking forward to new carpet, but, uh, you know, If Christians throughout our land would set themselves apart from the mission of Jesus Christ, truly set ourselves apart from the mission of Jesus and get involved, we couldn't keep our houses of worship empty on a Sunday morning. And please don't hear me saying that worship isn't important, but do hear me say this. Worship without being involved, involved in mission is nothing but lip service. Whoa. Worship without living my life for Jesus on mission for Jesus, coming to a worship service without mission is lip service. I don't want to be one who's just giving lip service to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The songwriter said, we have a story to tell to the nations. Jesus prayed that we'd tell that story. It's time we seek to answer that prayer. It's time we stop confusing the mission with busy religious activity, and we get to work telling the story. As we go, let's be reminded, Jesus has all authority. And through the Holy Spirit, he is with us. Through the Holy Spirit, he goes before us. He goes before us to prepare the way before we even get there, not just to prepare the way for the message, but to protect us. My prayer, you might think this is silly, but it's my prayer. My prayer is that through this year, Westside Baptist Church would become known as the disciples were known, those who turned the world upside down. Amen.